Today we're going to talk about the periodic table. You've seen the one in the classroom and you also have one in your reference table. Let's look at it with a little more depth. So the gentleman who gets credit for discovering the modern periodic table was Dmitry Mendeleev. He was a Russian scientist who lived in the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s. And what he did is he made a little card for each of the known elements of the time and then he developed that first systematic organization of all those elements. He put them into a little table and he did that initially by using the repetition of chemical properties. When we say periodic, when we talk about the periodic table or things that happen periodically, we're talking about things that happen on some regular basis and that's what he discovered. So let me show you what his table looked like. You can see there are a lot fewer elements than there were around 60 and you can see there are some question marks. We'll talk about those in just a minute. So what he did is he based it on chemical properties and the repetition of those chemical properties and he organized those into the, the columns that you see. And then he also put them in order by atomic mass. So we'll, we'll get into that a little bit further in just a minute. But the reason that Mendeleev gets credit for this rather than other scientists is that even though other scientists were trying to do the same thing, Mendeleev did something unusual. He actually predicted unknown elements. So those elements that have the question marks are the ones that he predicted would be discovered at a later date, and they were. So let me show you an example of that. A prediction that he made was echosilicon. It means below silicon, and you can see that he predicted the atomic weight, the density, the melting point, what it would look like, how it would form a compound with oxygen, how it would form a compound with chloride, and so on. And when germanium was discovered, you can see in the column on the right, if you compare that to that center column, those properties that he predicted were actually pretty doggone close, especially when you consider the fact that they had very little technology at that time when, when we look at what we have today. So that's just an example. Nobody's going to quiz you on that, but I just wanted to make you aware of it so you could see why he is the guy that gets credit. And then another person who was really uh, instrumental in the modern periodic table was a scientist named Henry Moseley. And what he did is he developed some experimental proof for the atomic numbers, that number at the top of the block, and we'll talk about that. Uh, his work actually led to a reorganization of Mendeleev's table. table. Remember, it was organized by atomic mass. He reorganized it by atomic number. And unfortunately, he was killed by a sniper in World War I. If you look, he was only alive for about 28 years. So he, there was a lot of promise in him that was never realized because of his death in World War I. And because of his death and the death of scientists like him in World War I, now when scientists are in the military, they are no longer sent into combat. And they do things like, if you look at... Uh, the World War II, the Manhattan Project, the development of the nuclear bomb. Now here's the modern periodic table. You've seen this before and it's actually organized into rows which are called periods. That's the name periodic table. And then columns which are called families and we'll talk about why they're called families later. So the periods are actually uh, the rows, those need to be numbered. The families are numbered at the top of your periodic tables. Uh, you can see group 1, 2, and 3, all the way through 18. And then if you'll number the periods, the rows, number 1 is the row with hydrogen, and then number 7 is the row with francium. So just go ahead and put those numbers on the left-hand side of your periodic table so you'll have those to look at when you're using it. Now, the names of the families, some of these families have special names. Group 1, is the alkali metals. You can see that they're group 1A and group 1. I'm going to call it group 1. When I was in high school and college, they actually used the 1A, 2A, uh, 3A, 3B, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's changed now, so it's just groups 1 through 18. But alkali metals are in group 1. And you can see that there's actually an element that's left out of that family, hydrogen. Hydrogen is left out because it is not an alkali metal, but it is in that column for a particular reason, which we'll get to soon. The next group is group 2, the alkaline earth metals. Now that's easy to get confused with group 1. They both have alkali in their names, but alkaline earth metals are a little different, and we'll do a lab to look at that. 
Now, group 16 are called the calcogens. And if you look at the beginning of that word, it actually looks kind of like the word chalk. And it comes from uh, chalk forming, chalk formers. So things that mix with oxygen, sulfur, those elements, those actually are, are kind of chalky substances. Group 17 are the halogens. And those are some that you might be familiar with, fluorine, chlorine, those sorts of things. And then you probably have heard of group 18. It's called the noble gases. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. They are considered inert. They do not react with others. They're called noble gases because they don't like to hobnob with the common elements. So um, carbon forms thousands and thousands of compounds. If you look, it's in group 14, element number six. The noble gases, there are six of those, and all, all of those elements combined only form seven compounds, I believe, right now, and that, that's probably going to change in the future, but they are very difficult to react, and so that's why they're called the inert gases or the noble gases. We'll call them the noble gases. That center block, is; those are called the transition metals, and those, as you can see, they're, they're all metals, and you may recognize some of them, copper, nickel, uh, iron, those sorts of things. And then the first row at the bottom, typically we're going to call those the lanthanides. When I grew up, those were the lanthanoids. You can see times have changed a little bit. And then that second row at the bottom, those are called the actinides. And it, you can, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how, why they're split off down at the bottom when we get a little further into the periodic table. The other thing that's really important for you to notice is this stair step line. And that's on your periodic table. You may want to darken it a little bit on your reference table just so you can see it well. And what it does is it separates the metals, which are to the right of the stair step line, from the nonmetals, which are to the left. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. If you look, now hydrogen is on the left of the stair step line. It's a nonmetal. You'll find that it's actually an exception quite often to the rules. And chemistry is full of exceptions, so try not to get too frustrated. You're going to run across a few of them. Uh, but you can see the metals to the left are green. The nonmetals to the right are kind of that orangey peach color. And then you see those light blue elements in the middle. Those are called metalloids. Those are actually the elements that touch the stair step line on a side. And I have that on a slide, so if you don't get that down, you can just uh, jump ahead and get it from the slide. So let's look at that a little more closely. Metals, they are to the left of the stair step line, as I said. And typically, if you think about the metals you're familiar with, like iron, copper. Those are things that are solids. They have to be heated to very high temperatures to melt. And they're good conductors of heat and electricity. Think about what the wires in your house are made of. Most people have copper wiring. And so that's how we conduct electricity. And we know we love our electricity for our cell phones and things like that. They also conduct heat well. Your, your pans at home may have a copper bottom on them. Not all of them do, but a lot of them do because they conduct heat well to, to heat foods evenly. They're also malleable, and that means they can be flattened or formed into a different shape. So um, if you take a piece of soft metal and hammer it, you can actually hammer it flat. And so we'll do some looking at those properties. They're also ductile, and if you're, that, that means it can be drawn into wires. If you're having trouble remembering that word, you might want to think about the word conducting. Electricity is conducted through wires, so they're ductile. When you look at nonmetals, nonmetals are kind of different. The properties are, are different. They're all to the right of the stair step line except for hydrogen. They're typically gases that have low melting points. Not all of them. If you look at, at some of them, they're not. And I'll show you on the periodic table in the classroom how to differentiate whether something's a solid, a liquid, or a gas. They're also very poor conductors of heat and electricity. So if you have a cup like this, you'll notice mine has the NC State logo on it. It has two walls of plastic, and in between there's some air, some gas in there. That helps to insulate my cup so that my drink stays cold. Or you might have double-paned windows, so two panes of glass with a little bit of air in between. 
They're also, if they're solids, they tend to be very brittle. So if you think about uh, carbon, carbon, an example of that would be charcoal. If you've ever smashed a charcoal chunk with a hammer, it just goes into a million pieces. So that, that's what brittle means. They're not malleable, they don't change shape, they just smash. The last category are the metalloids. And the metalloids are things that touch the stair-step line, not on a corner, just on a side. Okay, so make sure you make that note. Now, aluminum touches the stair-step line on a side, and it is not a metalloid. It is a metal. The other exception is polonium. You're not likely to be asked about that. That's the one at the bottom, but aluminum you do need to know. And if you think about it, you probably all had a drink from a soft drink can, so you know that aluminum is a metal. And they have properties that are kind of in between metals and non-metals, so they might be shiny, and they may be kind of malleable, but not as malleable as a metal. And typically, some of these elements are also semiconductors. So they conduct electricity, but not as well as a metal. So that's something interesting. They're used uh, in things like computer chips. They're really interesting if you, if you are interested in that sort of thing. So that's the information that we have for the periodic table, and I'll see you in class.